Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Building Custom GPTs with OpenAI Functions. My name is Matt Brown, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's discussion is being recorded, and you are currently in a listen-only mode. You can submit questions throughout the session using the Q&A functionality in the lower portion of your Zoom console. If this is your first time joining a single store webinar, heads up that we present weekly webinars demoing data and AI use cases and new technologies. And in fact, if you like today's topic, heads up that we will be presenting two new AI webinars next week. The first will be on Monday, and it's called Using AWS Bedrock and Langchain for Private LLM App Development. We do dozens of webinars on AI per quarter, and by far the two most common questions we get are, what is Langchain? Why am I hearing about it so much? And two, probably, my company is super concerned with data privacy and security, so how can I deploy private LLM apps in the cloud with enterprise-grade security? This session will cover all of that in one fell swoop. So if that sounds interesting to you, feel free to register right now. There's a bit.ly on your screen, the bit.ly AWS Bedrock Langchain Private LLM webinar. Put that link in the chat in a few minutes, or you can take a photo or a screenshot if you prefer. That'll also take you to that RSVP page where you can get your seat. Hopefully we will see you on Monday. And then the second webinar that we're doing next week is on Thursday. And that one is called How to Launch ChatGPT LLM Apps in Three Easy Steps. During this session, we will showcase a live, hands-on, step-by-step demo on how to build new AI apps that harness the full power of ChatGPT and OpenAI's latest features. So if that sounds fun to you, you can register right now at the bit.ly link that's on your screen. I'll put that in the chat in a few minutes. You can also take a photo or a screenshot of that QR code if you want to RSVP, and hopefully we'll see you on Thursday. Um, okay, back to today's topic. We would love for you to try out the technology that we're gonna be showcasing and showing a demo of in a few minutes. In fact, anyone who tries out uh, this today will be entered for a chance to win brand new AirPods Pros. All you need to do is visit the link that's on your screen. It's this bit.ly custom GPTs with functions raffle. That link I will put, I will also put that in the chat in a few minutes. You could also take a photo or screenshot of this QR code. And all you need to do to be eligible is log into single store. There's a free trial if you're a brand new user. There's also, we will consider existing accounts if you're already a customer or if you're an ongoing trial. So all you need to do is visit that link during this session, log in, I'll check the folks who've logged in and we will announce a winner by the end of today's session. I should also mention that we have awesome technical experts joining our Zoom Q&A. You might recognize Akmal Chowdhury, one of our more popular uh, webinar presenters. He is here, ready to answer your questions interactively. Uh, keep them coming in. We do have a huge audience today, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. We'll try to flag some from for the live Q&A, and if we don't get to any, we will email you. Um, okay, so let me introduce our speaker today. Madhukar Kumar is our Chief Marketing Officer. He is our Chief Developer Evangelist at Single Store. He originally has a background in software engineering. More recently, he has led product marketing and product management teams in the cloud data industry. Welcome to our audience. Welcome, Madhukar. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Matt. So speaking of um, AirPods, I just got back from AWS uh, yesterday. And not to put you on the spot, Matt, but is this the latest Gen 2 AirPod that we're talking about? That's a good about? question. I assume that we have access to that. <laughs> I will double check with our fulfillment provider, but I assume we do. I'll yeah, check. I'll tell you why. So uh, this is the second time. I was in Uber and we were going for dinner. And the by the time I reached the dinner place, I got a notification that, hey, your AirPods is no longer with you, which I thought was pretty cool. But then when I looked at it, I had dropped it at the Uber and uh, in the Uber car. So I uh, then, you know, we, we texted the driver, never responded. And I can see now that the driver is roaming around with my AirPods <laughs> everywhere, and but it's lost, it's gone. But I got the new one today and uh, 
I was pleasantly surprised that it has USB-C, so I don't have to carry on a lightning cable. That's why I asked. All right. So this time around, uh, hi, welcome, everyone. I wanted to do things a little bit differently and, and you know, given my a little bit of my uh, lazy developer background, I decided not to do our <laughs> slides. So I was just doing diagrams on the last couple of days, just thinking about what we are talking and what we are doing. And uh, I said, well, why not just pretend that we are just going through diagrams? Because I think it's a much easier way to explain things versus try and just show you all the slide by slide, which gets a little bit boring after a while. Not to say I will stop using slides, but we'll see. So what we want to do today or what we want to talk about today is, uh, first of all, custom GPTs and a close first cousin of custom GPTs called Assistants, uh, both released by OpenAI a couple of weeks ago. And this was much before the whole Sam Altman thing happened. So what I want to do is before jump into jumping into that, we have been talking about LLMs, we have been talking about retrieval augmentation generation for several months now, since February, March of this year. So I thought it would be good to just uh, trace the overall arc of where we started, where we are today. So it will make sense of what is a GPT. Then I will show you a quick uh, demo of that, that we, that we built, one for single store. And then what we'll do is we'll go into showing you how you can build your own as well. And that I think is the most exciting part. So there's a lot of stuff to cover. Let's get started. So first, you know, there were LLMs and this obviously since November of last year, the thing with LLMs was that uh, it was frozen in time. Like it was frozen in the data that it was trained on. So if you wanted your own company data to be used for information retrieval or for building out any Gen AI app, there was an emergence of a new pattern, which initially we were calling as in-context learning, but then eventually it became really big of uh, what people call as retrieval augmented, augmented generation or RAG. And what RAG is basically, think of it in a very simple way, is that let's say your LLM is a very smart prodigy child, knows everything about the data it has been trained on, but you have your company data that it doesn't know of, right? So what this does, uh, when a user asks a question, you use something like a lang chain or Llama index, and before you send that response to LLM or that query, you basically first go to your company data and then you search and retrieve. So if somebody says, hey, tell me something about uh, who is the CEO of your company five years ago. So obviously the LLM doesn't know, you go to your company data, you get back the retrieval, and then you send it to the LLM, which is called the context, and then you get back the information. So this is general RAG, right? And this has evolved. I've written a few articles on some advanced techniques on my medium as well. So we can share those details. Over a period of time, this really evolved. And then of course, the other thing that a lot of companies started to do was you would do what is called fine tuning of LLM, in which case it is basically telling the LLM that, hey, uh, I want you to respond in a certain way. And this is very similar to what OpenAI does with its own model, the chat GPT model or GPT-4 model, where you know the first stage was to train it on data. The second stage was to say, okay, I know that you can predict the next word, but using that technique, now here's a bunch of queries and responses. I want you to start talking like this or responding like this. So when you use search uh, and retrieve or retrieval augmented generation, obviously the company data is not a single database. You typically have something like a Mongo, MySQL, Postgres. You might have Snowflake. You might have BigQuery for your analytics. And then there's a whole bunch of unstructured data like your folders, uh, you might have documents with PDFs, you have images, and all of that. So now, if you are trying to do a search and retrieve, and this, by the way, this whole thing could be 10 petabytes. And you know, in some companies, it could be even larger than that. 
So when somebody asks a question about something related to your company, and this, by the way, is a very simplified version of saying that you're asking a question. It could be an API call. It could be any uh, any interface that is trying to um, engage with your application that you're building over here, right? So, and I've given an example of LangChain. Of course, there's a bunch of other libraries, uh, including Llama Index and stuff. They're both a little bit complementary, but you get the idea that this is the app that you are building. It's an enterprise app. It's not a prototype app. And so you start to do this and you realize, oh, wait, I cannot do a keyword search against all of this. So what you end up doing is you end up doing semantic search and semantic search requires the data to be converted into vectors first. So if this was all my data, I would now, a lot of companies said, oh, okay, I'm just gonna go use either Face or which is an open source library, or I might use an open source vector only database like Quadrant or Milvus or something like that. And when you start to do that, well, what happens now? You have 10 petabytes of data. You need to convert that into embeddings or vectors. And then now you're searching against that. So this thing typically can only do vectors. That means it can only store vectors. And some of these vector-only database can actually do keyword research as well, or keyword search. But it doesn't have the actual data of the PDF, which is still sitting here. So what you end up doing is you first make a call and you do a semantic search. Then you look at the metadata to say, where is that file? Then you make another call to that folder to get that file. Then you get back the data and then you might do a re-ranking and then finally you give it. So there's a lot of data movement, which is expensive, time consuming, and not ideal if you're trying to do a real-time application. So this obviously became a problem. And so this is where if you break it down in terms of what is involved, if I took a very simplistic, let's say a PDF document, I have to first extract the content. This is where you know I would use Langchain or Llama Index. These are really, really good libraries that simplifies things. And then if it's like a 4,000 word article, I might chunk it into 2,000 characters each. And then there is something called an overlap. So if there's a paragraph here, another paragraph here, I can overlap these chunks, create vectors for each one of these, and then uh, I also need to do other things. Like when I chunk this, I or when I chunk this, I want to maybe store a summary of that text, or I might also want to store some additional metadata. Most vector-only database has a very small metadata, you know, limit like forty KB, which is not enough if you're trying to store a bunch of things around who's what is this document who is entitled to view that document where is that document located when was it created these are all metadata associated with it and so again simplified version but assuming this looks as simple then actually what happens next is when somebody does a search that search could be a query again an api call or it could be a binary then you convert that into a vector then you would do a search you then get back the result. That result is then sent to your app, which then sends to your LLM model. And then finally you get the response back over here. So this involves a lot of, lot of different pieces to work together. And we're talking about enterprise grade application. We are not talking about prototypical, but just for a simple PDF, that's a lot involved. And the biggest issue is over here. Like how do you get just like we saw all the different data into one single place. And as we see, when you do search, it is actually searching across 10 or more petabytes of data, which is both structured, unstructured, and you want to do both keyword as well as you know semantic search as well. So this is where single store comes in. And this is not supposed to be a pitch for single store, but obviously we work for single store and I wanted to introduce what single store is. And so single store is, think of it as a database, which is a combination of MySQL plus maybe Vertica or Snowflake. 
And typically, as we saw in one of these diagrams earlier, what you have is a transactional database. So you might have Mongo, you might have uh, Postgres or MySQL. And single store is just like MySQL in that way, in the sense it's wire protocol compatible. You create a table, you well, SQL joins and you get back the queries. And SQL is one of the easiest and the one of the oldest languages, so to speak. But what it also does is it can pull in data through what is called pipelines from Kafka or from uh, your other data warehouses. And you can also create, like using LangChain and stuff, when you create the embeddings or vectors, you can store it all in one single table, right? So if I had this table, and I'll show this to you, I could have the name of the file, I could have the chunk of the text, I could have the vectors right next to it, I could have the user information. So it's all in one single place, which is the key differentiator. You didn't have to go add yet another database, but with this, you can just assimilate all of data into one single table and you run one query which we'll see, and it basically does everything. It, it, but more importantly, it does it in a simple um, millisecond kind of a basis. So why, why is that uh, differentiated for us? So here I'll switch over to a slide. The architecture over here is what differentiates single store in the sense when we built out the database, we started off 12 years ago, and we were uh, we were a memory first database. So similar to Redis, although Redis is only key value, or Memcache, all both Redis and Memcache primarily used for session management and caching. We created an in-memory database called MemSQL, and MemSQL was all distributed SQL, but it was entirely in memory. But a couple of years later, we added. Uh, local storage. So this could be SSDs and NVMEs. And then finally in the cloud, this is all cloud object storage. So when you create a table and you start inserting the data, we have this patented technology that takes that data and puts it in a storage that stores the data by rows, which is the classic transactional data, but it also stores the data as a columnar data. So if you're running any analytics, if you're doing aggregate functions or sum or group by, it is in milliseconds, unlike what you would do, let's say in Databricks or uh, Snowflake or Vertica or Parquet or Druid, there's several other just analytics-based database. And so when you do both, that brings both the transaction and analytics in, a, in one single place. So it opens up a bunch of different new use cases, like, you know, uh, DoorDash, Uber, where you are taking extreme amounts of data that's happening in real time and running analytics and then doing something with it right away. Or let's say you're doing security-based stuff like Palo Alto Networks, looking at streaming data and you're figuring out what is a what is an attack and then doing something with it or fraudulent credit card transactions and so on. So there were a lot of uh, Fortune 500 companies that were already using us for analytics. But over a period of time, what we did was we added support for multiple data types. So we added support for SQL, we added support for JSON. In fact, we have a product called Kai, which is fully compatible with Mongo APIs and Mongo SH. And we have, uh, you know, geospatial, everything except for graph, because that's a whole different animal altogether. And all of this is at Petabet petabyte scale. So this is what is differentiated. But what is interesting and what is relevant for this conversation is that in 2017, we added something called vectors, which is now all of a sudden all the rage. And that was because of a customer, Siemens, that I was just talking to yesterday. And uh, basically they said, hey, Google just wrote a paper on transformers and there seems to be really good output from semantic search. In fact, one, you know, when we were doing the POC and Siemens uh, added it, they were searching across all the HR data and they searched for something called poor leadership. 
And the result came back with a test which said, good leadership is rare these days. So there was nothing called poor or poor leadership anywhere, but the semantic search figured out because we used the exact KNN search algorithm. And that took off in terms of semantic search. And that is what essentially happens under the hood where within the same table, you have the vectors that you create, use APIs to create the vectors. And then of course, within the same uh, database, now you can run one single query. But two weeks ago, the world kind of changed where we went from one application doing everything to the notion of something called assistant or what Langchain was already calling as agents. So what is an agent or what is a GPT or what is an assistant? Interestingly, I had uh, done a master's thesis on multi-agent software engineering. And what agent is, think of it as almost a modular, but a self-independent program, kind of like many ways and uh, the next version of microservices which consists of an LLM. So you might have a model here, but it has custom prompts and instructions. So I might say, I need you to be a researcher and all you do is research. And when you respond, I want you to be formal. I want you to respond in grammatically correct English and you know, even a, per, a certain style. I always want you to provide citations. I want you to not make up any information and stuff and so on, right? The second thing it does is just like humans, it has custom tools. So as humans, I have a bunch of tools. When I want to do research, I have a browser. Or if I want to send out a message to somebody, I use an email. So these are a bunch of tools. And so for an assistant or for, think of it as a agent, you have these tools that are custom to that, right? So that's the second piece. And the third piece is what makes me different than somebody else or what makes Matt different from any other marketer, marketer is that he has custom knowledge. He has done certain things in the past and he has learned from it. So he has his own memory and knowledge that he uses constantly to basically his job, right? So if I were to personify a human, these are the three things needed. You need a custom instruction, which is your identity. You need a set of tools, and then you need custom knowledge, right? And this is exactly what OpenAI launched two weeks ago. The no-code version is called GPTs, and we will see what we built with single store. But GPT is only available to you through a chat GPT interface, right? So I can go in and uh, once I've created my custom GPT and I'll show you a couple of examples of what I have built, then uh, that's only through your browser and GPT. But the code version is called Assistant API. So imagine the exact same things, but here what you do is you can call it through some sort of a API or you can call it through an SDK, which is a software development kit. Uh, that could be in Python or that could be in uh, you know, JavaScript or whatever you're using to build it out. So think of it as exactly the same thing, except here you write the code to interact with it. And here you basically have the UI that OpenAI has given you and you cannot do much beyond that, right? But even then it's extremely powerful because let me give you a use case which I have started to work on. My use case is I write a bunch of articles, but when I write articles, I don't like the GPT-4 writing style. And two, I do a lot of research. I spend a lot of time trying to research on what is original content and content that has not been written about, and I might have a perspective on it. So it's like typically four to six hours of research. And then I would write the skeleton and then I would go and do for a little bit more research on those specific subtopics. And then I write it in my own style. And then it takes a good about sometimes a week, two weeks to write a 3000 word article. 
Now with here, what I've done or what I'm doing right now is I've taken all the articles I've written and I give it to the GPT to say, hey, this is your custom knowledge. Pretend that you're Madhukar, pretend that you write articles. This is the writing style. I want you to just look at these 20 articles of my favorite articles. And I want you to just kind of imbibe it, the adjectives I use, the storytelling I use and things like that. Then I give it some tools and I'll explain those tools in a second. And then I say, by the way, your custom instruction is that you are uh, just like a human, but you write, and this is how you do research, and this is how you engage. So there are custom set of instructions, which makes this GPT different. And custom tools would also include maybe a YouTube researcher, a Medium article researcher, a Twitter or X researcher, and so on. So these are a bunch of different tools. And this, what used to be RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation, more recently, if you're using GPT, you can actually just not have to write the code. You can just upload your content and that custom knowledge could be imbibed over here. Now with Assistant APIs, if you're building a enterprise grade application, you want it to also talk to your database, right? So there you would still need a bunch of uh, SQL queries. So first let's look at this custom tool and what exactly is it? So when I do a custom tool, it's essentially a JSON object that I say, oh, I want you to go to weather.example.com and uh, here's a description of that uh, function. But if you go to this endpoint, which is slash location, and uh, you pass these parameters, it's cut off over here, then you'll get back when you give me this information, when you call this URL and this endpoint and you give it a bunch of parameters, it will give you the temperature. And so this you embed inside of GPT and I'll show it to you in a second. And then uh, if you were to write this, you could simply write this as a Python script and you can run it in a bunch of different places. So let me make this bigger in case people are not able to see it. It's a very simple, uh, you know, fast API based application. But again, this is code version. You could really do a no code version by just calling Zapier or a bunch of other endpoints that you get from no code and you should be good. So let's look at what a GPT looks like, right? Uh, All right, so here I have a GPT and I have created this, or not me, but within single store, we have created this custom GPT, which has a URL. So let's, let's look at the GPT first. When you are in chat GPT, is this visible or do you want me to make this bigger? Matt? Yeah, you might want to make it a little bit bigger if that's possible. The text looks a little small for me. How about now? Getting getting better. You could even do one more. Okay. There you go. Yeah. All right. So first thing what you do is you go to the explore button and you see a bunch of GPTs that chat GPT has created or open AI has created, right? And these are specific things. So uh, I think there's one for DALI, which will only give you, will only give you, um, you know, image-based stuff and so on. And the one that we've created is called Single Store, right? So when you click on it, it's very much similar to ChatGPT, except that it has a different, those three things that we talked about. It has a different knowledge base, it has different set of instruction, and it has a different set of tools. So for example, I can ask this uh, single store GPT to say, hey, tell me what do you do? And here it's telling me I'm a specialized version of chat GPT. My pri primary function is to assist users in connecting to a single store database and then perform data analysis through running queries and creating Jupyter notebooks. So now this becomes really interesting if you are a data analyst or data engineer 
and you're trying to do some sort of data analysis on some sort of data set that you have, but you're probably like me, you don't want to run SQL and you know just copy paste. I just want to talk to it in English, right? So how, how do I do that? So basically what you do, and I was just doing this before this call and earlier as well, and then I reached the limit for GPT-4. So let me show you how this works, if this cooperates with me now. And uh, here we are, let's say. So I said, connect to a database, connect to my database. So it gives me a link, uh, this one, which is obviously expired now. But at that point, it would ask me for user ID and all of the other details, which I'm going to show. Then I say, hey, are you connected to my database? And it says, yep, I am. Then I ask it, what tables and columns do you see in there? And it says, oh, I see a table called US Chronic Disease Indicator CDI. And these are the columns. And by the way, here's what I see in the data. There's a year column, there is a topic of diabetes and the question asked and so on and so forth. So I said, can you draw a graph of some insights that you see in this table? So it asked me for a bunch of question and it actually generated the image. I think it might not be showing it because again, either I had reached the limit or yeah, there we go. Or for some reason, sometimes, you know, it's it's still pretty new. So just expect it to be not perfect. And then I say, by the, then it tells me the X axis represents the year. The Y axis represents the average crude prevalence of diabetes. I don't know what that is, but you get the idea. Similarly, what I had done earlier was I said, by the way, whatever analysis that you just did, uh, which was right here, you know, I kept back and forth. I said, whatever analysis you did, just create a single store notebook that I can download and then I can use within single store. So at the end of it, it says, okay, great. Here's the notebook. And again, this is also um, ephemeral link. So it's not permanent. Only after you do it, it disappears after a while. So how did I do it? Well, first and foremost, let me show you the uh, single store part. And if you follow along, by the way, as uh, Matt mentioned, you you would get put into the raffle for that uh, airport. So let me now go back into single store. But before I go to single store, there's this nifty little site, not little, called uh, catalog.data.gov. And this is uh, by the US government. And they have a bunch of free data sets. These are all anonymized that you can download as CSV, right? So what I did was I downloaded this one, the US chronic disease indicator. Then what you want to do is, oops, looks like I timed out. So let's say let you go to simplestore.com and you can say try free and you follow through over here. I already have an account. So I just say, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I already have an account. So it knows that it's associated to the logged in account and it just drops me in here. So this is the single store portal. And one of the thing about single store is that your database is different from where you run your queries, which we call as a workspace. So as you can see, I have several different databases that's running. And the workspace is, think of it as a um, virtual machine. And you can create multiple workspace. You can do it in either AWS, GCP, or Azure, or you know there's a self-managed version as well. And when you create, you can choose how much RAM do you want and so on. So for the database, you're actually just paying 0 0.002 or something like that for storage. And here, when you are running this, you are paying for this as pay for use, but when you are done, you can terminate it, you can suspend the workspace and you don't get charged for it. But if you sign up today, I think you get like $600 worth. So you can run this for like next few months uh, very easily. And if you're trying to do something beyond that, feel free to reach out. 
you can just go here and then say, uh, where am I? Let me see. You could say, chat with us. And you could say, hey, by the way, I am looking for more credits or whatever. And somebody, there's a human in my team that <laughs> is listening to this and they'll get back to you very quickly. All right. So what I did was uh, I created this workspace and then I created this database by just clicking on this and calling it, and here's telling you the price as well. Calling it, uh, I just did it called demo.nov, uh, November. So here, when I look at my databases, I, I will see it and I'll show you the table as well. But the next thing is notebooks and notebooks is where I would load up that CSV file. So when I go to this webinar demos, I get this thing called stages. Stages is your file system. So I upload the CSV file from here that I just downloaded from data.gov. And uh, here it is, it's national obesity by state.csv. So once I've uploaded it, I click on these three and then I say load to database. I choose my workspace. Then I say, okay, I wanna do it in uh, demo nov and I say generate notebook and I have just done this so if I do this again it's going to throw an error so I'm going to show you what it does and what the end state looks like but basically what it's doing is it takes the CSV and it's probably the coolest part and it infers what the table schema should look like and it generates the code for you well this is like uh, for me, it used to be like one week of work if there was like a large number of data set that I would be working with. So it says, hey, use this database, by the way, which is what we have selected from here. And I didn't have to put credentials or anything. And it creates the table. It creates the pipeline, which is fast ingest. It takes the CSV, uh, generates this code, dumps it into the table. This is a very simple one. It starts the pipeline. And then it uh, basically says, show me what's in the table. And you, you just do select star from demo now. So let me show you that. Uh, uh, where did we save it? Here we go. All right. So as you can see, this was executed, 1.16 seconds. Uh, we ran the pipeline and then we checked the pipeline to see if there's any error, nothing came out. And now when I say select star from Demonov, all this uh, data is showing up. Now, if I wanted to see this data in a different way, I could just go back to my database and this is the data, a database. Here's the table, I click on the table, I click on sample data and I can see all of this, right? So I can run SQL on it as well. So this is from the single store side of thing. Just to recap, very simply, you download a CSV file, you come to single store, you go to stages, upload your CSV file, then you say load to database, it create the notebook for you, and then you run the notebook, and now you have a database and table, right? And then the GPT that we were creating is basically a GPT that talks to you or talks to this database or any database that you connect to in plain English. So let's get back to the GPT and how do you create a GPT? So one thing that uh, in my other account that I have is, I wanna show that to you very quickly. I have a bunch of other GPTs that I've also created, like YouTube Researcher is one, um, your voice scribe is what I was talking about earlier. So if I come here and I say edit GPT, you would see that, uh, you know, basically I give instruction, it helps you to build it out. But when I look and configure, these are the three things that I talked about. So you have your name, you have custom instructions. So remember this was the first thing that uh, 
we talked about. And I said that, hey, you're a researcher, you're a writer, and specific to my voice. Then I say, here are some of the conversation starters. And here I just uploaded my file. And when I uploaded my file, I had uh, my all the articles that I'd written. I just put it in a PDF file and uploaded it. These are some of the functions as, that I've enabled or the tools. But what I can do now is I can also give it additional functions. So remember what we did over here is you have this and then you write your own or you basically use an existing API. So what I do is um, say create new action. And when you look at uh, weather, it'll tell you, you know, this is what the schema should look like. It's very straightforward. It You can basically even ask chat GPT to generate it for an existing API endpoint that you've created or somebody else has created. And you are, it will tell you these are the different uh, actions that's available. You can do a test. And then this becomes one of the tools that gets added to your custom GPT. And then if you want to test it, you just test it over here. And finally, when you're done, you can say, hey, publish this either only for me or I want to share it with some of my friends. So I want this to be a link or it could be a public link. When you say a public link, then you also have to create a privacy policy and you have to share that privacy link over here. So depending on what you want to do, you have those options. Now, the one that we I've been working on is, let's say, um, Alfred. And Alfred is, is a GPT that is for basically research. And so again, same things. I can upload files to it and I can make it just, you know, have those three specific things. But if you want it, obviously now this is all no code version. If you want to build a code version, you basically go to platform.openai and then you click on assistance. And as you can see, this is one assistant that I've been working on. And this is called single store guru. It's supposed to answer questions related to single store. This is a prototype by the way. So don't bother taking the ID. It's not gonna do anything. So now what I do is say test in playground. And when I test in playground, it's very similar to GPT. I can give it a name, I can give it instructions. So again, these are your custom instructions. I can choose a model. This one GPT-4 1106 is the preview model. This was released on November 6th, if I'm reading this right. And I, very similar to the other one, I can give it the tools that GP, that OpenAI created, which is the code interpreter and the retrieval, I can add files, which is what I just did, which is single store, you know, it's a, it's, it's a just simple document about single store FAQ. And here, when I add a function, it's exactly the same way that you have in your uh, custom GPT. Now, when, when I'm done, I can just do a test and uh, in order to do this, I believe I have to do test in playground and I can just, just like GPT, I can run it. Now I can just go do in my code, I create a Python file or whatever your application language you're using. Then you can just import the GPT library with the assistant ID. You will get a separate ID for each one. You can then start calling these and this would work. So here's an example, which we are, will share right after this for how to build it to talk to your database. Because typically what happens is when you're doing a no code, you are typically just you know using someone else's data. If you want it to be your own data, then you want it to connect to your database, right? So what we did is we built this for single store. Single store is MySQL wire protocol compatible. So we create, you know, you just create a simple Python virtual environment. 
and you install a bunch of libraries, including UV Corn, which allows you to run it using ngrok. And then you just write your code where very simply, I'm just using a MySQL connector, passing it the host credential information. I make it as a fast API based in interface. And then I add my own middleware here. I just get the query, run it into SQL. I get the response and then I return it back. And then here's the JSON query or the JSON schema. I add to my custom GPT or assistant. And now similar to what I was showing earlier, I can run this as an application on my laptop, or you can use something like Replit, which is another way of deploying your application. And then basically it's talking to your database. This could be all behind your firewall if you choose it to be, and uh, it's talking to your database. So now it is talking to structured, and because it's single store, it also has vectors. So you are basically doing both at the same time. But all of this is now encapsulated into what we earlier saw as, um, as an agent. And now, with, and we'll cover this in a separate uh, webinar, you can now take multiple agents and make them talk to each other and then do an entire differentiated and complex workflow that is only unique to you. So even though this model and this set of uh, tools that you have is available to everybody, you can still make it extremely differentiated for yourself because you are giving a different tool, you are giving a different set of instructions, which is your prompt and fine tuning, and you're giving a different knowledge, which is your database as well as all the unstructured data as well. So that covers what I wanted to talk about today. I know we touched upon a lot of things, but just to then close out on um, what we covered was the world is moving towards agents and assistants and agent and assistant consists of an LLM model. It consists of custom knowledge and it consists of custom prompt and fine tuning. There are two variations of it within OpenAI that you can use. One is for no code, which is custom GPT. And the other one is called assistant API. We saw that there is a single store GPT that we created, which allows you to connect to a single store database and then talk to it in English. And it will give you even the Python notebook Jupyter file that you can use to create your dashboard and whatnot and share with others as well. And if you create a GPT or assistant and you want to talk to a single store database, then you get both structured as well as the vector data. That's the big difference and advantage here versus using something that is just either within GPT or just a you know vector only database. So I'll stop here and see Matt if there are questions. Yes, there definitely are. There's there's probably more questions than we'll be able to answer in the next few minutes, but keep the questions coming in. We'll answer as many as we can, and we'll email folks that uh, we don't get to. Madhukar, I've seen a couple questions about, you know, the resources. Like, one question is, like, where can I find the single store GPT? Is there a link for this? Can I search for it in the store? You want to talk yes. about that first? Yeah, so we will send it out as part of the email. And uh, like I said, right now, when I was just playing with it before this webinar, it was throwing an error. So I wanted to share it in the webinar, but now that I'm getting an error, I just want to make sure that we, if it's something on our side, we fix it before we share it with you. But you will get it one way or the other in an email. Good stuff. I also see some questions about, can I get that that Word document that you sh that you showcase that's uh, you want to share, should we share that too? Absolutely. That's going to be a blog. So you would be able to just go and look at the blog and download it from there. Good stuff. Let's see. There's, there's been some questions about fine tuning. Um, do you want to talk a little more about fine tuning? Yeah. So fine tuning is 
a way to make your LLM behave in a certain different way. And so think of how even large language models are created. Step one is training or unsupervised training on a large corpus of data. And step two is fine tuning. And fine tuning basically means now that you've learned how to do recommendations, the way you respond is in this way. So you give it a ground truth and you give an example of a query and then it gives the, you also give the responses. So that's the data set you would create and then feed it to your large language model and it will behave differently. Now, the thing to remember about fine tuning is you fine tune an existing model. And if that model changes, you have to fine tune that new model again. So something to keep a note of, which is why I think retrieval augmented generation works a lot better for knowledge sharing versus fine tuning. Fine tuning is mostly a complementary way of making the behavior changes. Good stuff. Um, here's a, here's a, or go ahead, Mariko, you want to choose your questions? Yeah, I see there was one question on, can we give some more info of how to migrate PDF or file system to a vector DB? And I see Akmal was writing it. Akmal, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yes, Maduka. Sorry, I, I, I was I, I was going to provide some links, and then I suddenly realized we've actually got a chapter in our book that does exactly that. So <laughs> I posted a link for the free book. So that's a great way to do it. So it's actually very easy with Langchain, as you know. I mean, it's dead easy because all, all of the plumbing, if you like, the low-level stuff is handled by the framework. You just say, okay, point it to where the PDF file or PDF files you want to read, uh, chunk them up. You can store them in single store DB. You know, you've got the embeddings and then away you go. You can uh, start to query and uh, do, uh, you know, interesting searches and uh, look for relevant text. And yeah, and in fact, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would say also check out singlestore.com slash spaces, which has yeah. a bunch of different example, but fully complete and ready notebooks. And one of them shows you <clears throat> how to take a PDF and convert it into embeddings and store it in single store. Yeah. One question that I see is, how is single store compared to Superbase? Pros and cons. Very interesting question. In fact, I'm writing like a 4,000 word article comparing all vector only databases. And I was about to hit publish. And then yesterday, AWS announced that they added vectors to like five or six different, more different databases. In every, my take on this is, so we have had vectors since 2017. This year, probably every single database out there, including a graph database, by the way, uh, Neo4j, they all added vectors. Superbase, if I understand correctly, is the open source version of Firebase, which is primarily based as a backend for authentication, but you know anything that you want to do quick and easy to deploy. And it does vectors and it does row-based, but it definitely i don't know if it has all the enterprise grade features that we have which is support for json support for sql support for vectors exact knn plus the approximate knn which is coming another month and then uh, also doing all of this at petabyte scale in a few milliseconds so the difference would be that it's a full blown um DR and all the other enterprise grade features. You have R back at row level and so on, and uh, horizontal scalability and so on. With Superbase, from what I understand, it does SQL, it does vector. Not sure if it does the other data types as well. All right, so we have another question on can we have multiple orgs? I'm assuming this is in reference to single store and uh, the answer is yes, you can have multiple orgs. You can join other orgs too. And within the org, you can create multiple workspace groups, then workspaces. And then within workspaces, you have different databases, but you can connect the database to a different workspace at a later point if you wanted to. So keep in mind, it's a disaggregated compute and storage. Even NVIDIA has introduced a concept of agents. Is that something you have explored with single store? 
Yeah, I would say uh, agents think of it as the entire package of what something uh, can do, like a modular, almost like a human. Where single store comes in is the knowledge part, right? Where it is the structured and unstructured, the ability to do lexical as well as semantic, and the ability to run it on both on-prem, hybrid, as well as cloud. So that's where we play into the agent. We don't build the agent ourselves, although within the notebook, you can do that. I'm sure we can build some examples to show that as well. But you're right, uh, there is a lang chain that does agents too. That's my favorite. And Microsoft added this open source version called Autogen, which is really one of the best, um, I would say, resources to take multiple agents, including open AI assistants, and make them work together. In fact, maybe that could be our next webinar topic as well. Will you be able to share the YouTube research GPT? I know it was shown very quickly. Sure, I can send that link as well. Do you think that custom GPTs will completely substitute the RAG model or is there still a niche for RAG? I think it will not completely remove RAG, but for no code, uh, by the way, you can do this in Flowwise too, which has a connector to single store. Uh, RAG will still remain for enterprise. And in fact, that's probably the right way to do it because just as we saw in GPT, you can only upload unstructured file for now. You cannot connect it to a database unless you're doing it the way we are doing, which requires coding. And if it requires coding, then you might as well build an assistant API versus doing it in GPT. And that better way to do it would be through RAG. How do you ensure that the vectorized database and the SQL database are in sync? Is it something built inside of single store? Great question. So think of single store um, as a table, just like an Excel sheet, and there are a bunch of different columns. One of those columns could be vectors. And that's the differentiator. So you could say, select column A, column B, column C, join with column A of another table, and then do a dot product of column of this query with vectors from column C. So you are doing mixing and matching of multiple different data types and vectors in one single query versus with anything else, it would have taken five hops. It would have taken ETL and would have taken a lot of uh, precious time and money. The assistance API has largely obviated the need for explicit RAG process, hasn't it? I would say no. I would say, first of all, assistance API does have a way to upload unstructured data. That unstructured data you might want to be aware of costs $77 per year per GB. So it's not cheap. And number two is only unstructured. If your database is sitting in SQL and JSON and graph and other places, then you still have to use RAG. And RAG is more control, more governance, which is what most enterprises look for. Hey, Madhukar, we should probably wrap up and announce the AirPods winner, given sure. the time. All right, so quick reminder before we, we tell that winner. The first is that on Monday, we're going to be doing another webinar. It's called Using AWS Bedrock and Langchain for Private LLM App Development. Akmal right here is going to be presenting that. If you're interested in private LLM apps in the cloud with enterprise-grade security, hopefully we'll see you there. I, I put the link in the chat just a minute ago. And then on Thursday, we will be presenting how to launch ChatGPT LLM apps in three easy steps. You can join us for that step-by-step -step approach demo. Um, that'll be on Thursday. I put that RSVP link in the chat as well. And then the announcement you've been waiting for, uh, our AirPods winner is Rachid O, uh, software engineering lead at Alamar Biosciences in Fremont, California. You are the winner. Congrats. Rachid. If that's not you, don't give up. We'll be giving out one more AirPods by the end of the day to anyone who tries out the new single store GPT. Um, check your email for a link to that. We'll also be emailing out the recording to this and uh, you know the resources, the blog that, that Madhukar mentioned. So keep an eye on your inbox. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Madhukar, for an awesome presentation today.
Bye, everyone. Thank you.